But anyway, so what I'm going to share with you uh, in the next five minutes is really quickly, I'm going to just share some thoughts regarding ESG. Um, and it might just very quickly give you a little bit of a summary of my background so that it kind of fits the context around it. So I spent the 90s as a lawyer with Clifford Chance and Alan Overy, focused largely on project finance and energy law. Um, and then I was a GC and head of compliance for two um, global energy companies. And we basically financed and operated wind, hydro, biofuel, power stations. In particular, if you've ever heard of First Hydro, which is a hydro facility hollowed out of the mountains of Snowdonia. Uh, fascinating um, uh, place, and I used to be on the board of that many years ago. So environment, carbon credits were key drivers to that. And in the last decade, um, obviously, I founded this data company, and we focus on working out how to pull data and contracts and external information together to do better reporting uh, and um, compliance and insights. Um, but supply chain has been a primary focus of our work. Um, I think largely exactly who are um, global suppliers across any organization and how can we find ways to save resources and cost across that. And a lot of focus on what's traditionally been sort of modern slavery, anti-bribery anti and environmental issues, which I think we've now seen over the last few years ramp up into this more expanded international and national fr regulatory frameworks that we're all calling ESG, right? Um, I like to just think of ESG if it helps as a set of criteria and standards that help socially conscious investors um, and uh, uh, customers and employees and the public to screen um, potential involvement with any organization. It's one of the ways they're going to test, do I want to work with this organization? And so obviously by corollary, are you going to uh, make any revenue and, uh, and work with them? So um, I think the, um, the impact of ESG on firms is only going to get better, bigger and bigger. It's key to brand, uh, it's key to raising finance, it's key to attracting clients and keeping them, and it's going to be key and more so to attracting the best talent and I think um, clients are asking, as I was saying, firms for ESG as part of their procurement process when they select them. And we're seeing that happen more and more and more. Everyone's putting in a great CV for what their firm can do for the client. And procurement more and more are asking as part of that, show me that you're ESG compliant. A, because it's the right thing to do. And B, because we don't want to get embarrassed at some stage in the future if it turns out that something's gone wrong with, um, with uh, your supply chain, which causes us all an embarrassment. So as it turns out, 70% of ESG compliance is involved around your supply chain. And this makes sense when you think about it, because if for most organizations, they take goods and services and they combine them, uh, ingest them into their business and they combine with their special magic, some form of manufacturing process to create the goods and services that they sell. Now, obviously, professional services firms are slightly different because their main thing is selling the expertise of their people. But a large law firm can still have uh, a thousand and some of the really big ones, 3,000 suppliers globally. So this is a lot of information to be able to organize, not just as a one-off, but you need to be able to track it over time consistently. Think about all the suppliers in IT, facilities and operations, utilities, insurance, business travel, office and print, meetings and events, landlords, BD, communications, telecoms, um, professional services for your tax and audit. It goes on and on. There are a lot. Um, and remember, ESG doesn't matter really about the supply size of your supply chain. People want to understand that your ESG um, um, compliance, um, as we we're just talking. And I think it is moving now to a regular board level area for a lot of our clients, not necessarily in the law firm yet and the professional services firm yet, um, but it's heading that way because there's going to be more ESG regulation and it's going to become more important. So the question is, where do you start? So obviously you start with an accurate uh, ongoing updated list of your suppliers and it's surprising to say it's not as easy as you might think to get that from a lot of businesses. Um, if you have any doubt, um, ask inter inter internally, go and ask tomorrow, give me a list of all our suppliers in our business and particularly tell me how they're categorised around the right industry sectors, particularly those ESG flags for around industry suppliers for water, in, uh, for water gas, electric, buildings, um, rent, uh, landlords and uh, waste management and the kind of obviously things around temporary labour etc. It's not so necessarily to get that information as quick as people might think and of course mapping those suppliers against um, you know the countries of risks around the world when you're looking at global supply chains. But of course to get ESG scoring you're going to need more than sets of data. Organisations are needing to review their contracts and in particular 
have a sort of a portal or a way of communicating, a little bit like we just did this morning on a poll, <laughs> um, where you communicate with your suppliers and you can ask them the questions directly, which can be in, in overlaid into your data. What is your carbon footprint? Do you have a procurement sustainability policy? Have you ever lost any or got the right permits, etc.? Information you just will not have in your data or contracts, but it's key to being able to analyze your suppliers from an ESG point of view. And once you've gone through all that, some of your suppliers will fall short and they'll have to take corrective actions or some of them might be replaced. But it means that you can start to show that your supply chain is an ESG compliant um, um, uh, supply chain. And I guess that coming into land really with all things, you know, there's a manual resource intensive way of trying to track this over time because it's complex and they're also, you know, smart tech that can help with end-to-end -end solutions with things like machine learning and technological innovation and AI, etc. Um, so I think just to, as I said to finish, there is a focus really on ESG is only going to expand. It's 70% plus about your supply chain. It's not just a one-off exercise. It's a business as usual reporting requirement. And I think how this is managed will, great to a greater degree, positively and negatively affect your brand, the ability to raise finance, but very importantly, retain and win new business and attract the best talent. And the last comment I've just got to leave with you just to think about as a takeaway is um, we're seeing not, not just law firms obviously being approached for and consultancies being approached for advice around ESG. And what we're seeing now is quite a lot of um, professional firms talking to tech companies to say, well, we can give our clients a legal page of advice, but that actually is a bit of a vacuum. And what a lot of the customers are saying, their clients are saying, I need your advice to be overlaid against my business. And so we're starting to see quite a lot of partnerships coming along where consultants are saying, can you help or can other vendors, can they help with the data side so that we've got something upon which we can apply our legal advice, which is an interesting uh, development as well. So thank you. Thanks for listening.